Hey, um, well, thank you for the super warm um, introduction. I'm super excited to be here today to talk through um, what I personally think is one of the um, most important um, product areas and weights and biases for um, enterprise teams working on model development. Um, but I'm, I'm biased because I'm one of the product managers here at Weights and Biases, um, and I'm primarily focused on um, a bunch of different areas, but primarily artifacts, model registry, and some of the features that we will be talking through around um, automations. Uh, before coming to Weights and Biases, um, I was a product manager at Scale AI um, and did work around uh, synthetic data. Um, so I'm excited to kind of take um, my learnings from, um, you know, managing um, complex models and, and data sets and um, walking through some of the stuff that we've been doing here at Weights and Biases to make it easier to manage uh, models in uh, production. Cool. So just to set the stage on um, where the model registry becomes relevant within um, a machine learning team's uh, workflow. Um, so you can see here that on the left-hand side of the screen, um, we have kind of our experimentation. This is where folks like data scientists, uh, machine learning engineers um, are super involved in this workflow of you know, creating models, evaluating them, packaging them. And then on the right hand side uh, is kind of the, the second part that's more focused on deploying models to production, releasing them and, and monitoring them. Um, so to walk quickly through what a practitioner's workflow might, might look like, um, and, and we'll go more into detail um, a, bit, a bit later, but you can imagine you have your data scientist or machine learning engineer that's developing these models um, in, this, in the experimentation process they're producing hundreds of training and evaluation runs um, to try to improve a model's performance. Um, and then eventually we get to the kind of part around like deployment where a new model that comes from all of those hundreds of um, training runs is eventually released. Um, and in the middle, we can see the staging step. So very similar uh, to the world of DevOps, staging is the step in between where a practitioner says, hey, I have a new candidate for release and we need the model registry to house these staged models and, and manage all of the workflows associated with uh, candidate models. Um, so again, left-hand side, very data science, uh, research heavy, and then the right is kind of all the work that's being done to, to keep the product running and operational. And the goal of the model registry is to be this kind of centralized point as models pass from, from left to right. Uh, so one thing I wanted to spend some time talking about is, uh, you know, are we inventing the, the wheel here or where have we seen this um, in other workflows? And I think the, the best example um, is how do we solve this problem in, in software um, now? Um, so I think we can really think of, you know, the model registry and, and you'll notice similarities in terminology here, but it's kind of like a container registry, uh, like Docker Hub. Uh, so a developer is publishing an image to this container registry and anybody can download and consume this image, um, obviously if they have the appropriate uh, permissions to, to be doing so. Um, and there's a few other pieces of similarity. So, you know, versioning and tagging of these images, um, each container image uh, is, is versioned and, and kind of has its own tag. Um, this piece is crucial for kind of how you maintain differentiating a dif differentiation between versions um, of an application or a service. And then also kind of how do you ensure that specific versions can be deployed or rolled back um, if, if needed. Um, image distribution, so kind of enabling the distribution of container images across many different environments. Uh, and the same theme that we see around collaboration. So teams can now share and collaborate on a standardized uh, container image. Um, the other two pieces to mention, which we'll, we'll dive more into how they're relevant to model registry, um, but we see patterns around using these container registries for access control um, and integration with uh, CI, CD. Um, the other example that I have here on the bottom right, again, is a different type of registry that we're familiar with um, from the world of software. So similar to, to Python package registries like PyPy, uh, we have this public registry of Python libraries, and this facilitates the, the distribution of Python packages. Um, so developers can easily, uh, easily share their, their libraries. 
um, and kind of post them to to this registry. And then anyone in the in the community, in the broader Python community, um, can kind of use them and install them. So across these two examples, and uh, you know the world, the, the patterns we saw around publishing and, and using in model registry. Um, what do all these things have in common? And then what do these, these software solutions enable? Uh, so they enable a way for developers to, to build and package code and publish usable versions of their code to a, a central repository so that others on the consumer side, so that might be a dev team, it might be an ops team, uh, can go ahead and, and consume um, these, these models uh, directly, or sorry, in this case code, but in the world of model registry, um, consume models directly. Uh, nice. So I'm going to spend some time talking through, um, you know, you're an enterprise team, uh, you have a bunch of machine learning engineers, and, you know, you're putting models into production. Why, why, why should you care about um, this, this tool called a, a model registry? Um, and, and what are kind of the, the big, the, the most important highlights and, and benefits of implementing one into your team's, um, uh, you know, model CI CD workflow? Um, so the first piece is abstracting out the, the messiness of experimentation. Um, so you can see here that on the left-hand side, um, this is kind of a screenshot of um, our artifacts uh, product, um, which really at a project level is, is storing all of the different model checkpoints that are being created. Um, so you have a bunch of different runs, and even within those runs, you know, you might have hundreds of different checkpoints, and you need a way to kind of post the, the checkpoints that are candidates for production um, so that, you know, whoever needs to consume it, so like the MLOps engineer or the team lead that's trying to see the, the latest and, and greatest model um, or, you know, the product manager isn't sifting through hundreds of checkpoints and trying to figure out, hey, which, which was the one that you wanted me to put into production? Cool. The second piece is on governance and uh, control. So being able to answer questions for models that are in production who promoted this model? When did they promote it? What was the exact version of the data set used? What kind of post-processing happened to this data set uh, before model training? So a production model is going to be served to users and the implications of a model that's deployed without proper approvals are you know, a lot greater, there's a lot more at stake than publishing um, to a conference papers. So one example that I wanted to pull in um, from one of the customers that we're working with closely, um, they're a large enterprise customer and they're putting large generative AI models into production. Um, and they have kind of requirements from their legal and compliance teams and need to be able to prove that for the, the models that are putting into production, each model that's being deployed can be traced back uh, to prove that it was trained on a, on a data set that was licensed um, or, or public and that the, the company has permissions to be training these generative models on a specific data set. Um, and that's where this, the story of lineage becomes really important that we, we saw in this slide here. Um, this is kind of one, one snapshot, but you know, having anyone from the compliance or security or audit team being able to say, hey, this is the model in production. Um, I want to be able to work backwards myself and see that the data set you used to train it on um, you know, was, is licensed so that we don't get in trouble uh, with legal implications downstream. Um, and then this is kind of a, a, nice, a nice comic um, that I've been referencing a lot when uh, talking to customers, but you know, you would you'd be shocked at how many customers we we talk to uh, regularly. That um, when they first start using the product, one of the biggest questions that they have a tough time answering is, "I have a model in production. I don't know which exact snapshot of data was um, was used." Um, so yeah, that's on the piece of kind of governance and, and control. And then the last story is around um, accelerating model rollout. Uh, and this becomes relevant uh, if we think of that kind of graphic that we saw in the beginning around we have experimentation on the left-hand side and we have production on the right-hand side. Typically within large, uh, large enterprise teams, there's different cohorts or, or different types of, of folks that are responsible um, for doing the experimentation. Um, and then the folks deploying these models to production. Uh, and the personas, we'll, we'll dig into a little bit more of that in, in the next slide, but um, what we see there is this critical handoff point uh, that 
without a model registry is super slow, frustrating, and, and error prone. Um, so again, we see kind of these scary questions like, or comments, hey, like I think you deployed you know, the wrong model, I sent the wrong file. Um, oh, well, I didn't know this new model was even ready. Um, oh, I, I kind of deployed this model because I thought that's it was ready to be deployed and that's what you know person XYZ told me. Um, so the more time um, practitioners are, are spending, you know, doing this manual process um, of handing off to the ML ops um, team, the less time they're spending on on their work on uh, model improvement. And then, to, you know, the, the same story goes for folks on the ML ops side. So they're spending kind of a bunch of time trying to find the right model and then rolling it back in case a mistake was made and the wrong model was deployed. In the end, and in the end of the day, you know, the longer it takes end users to, to use the current best model, um, this is kind of dollars lost for, for the team because there's a new model that's ready to be used. Let's make it uh, as fast as possible to, to roll this out um, to the surface. And just to talk a little bit about these personas that I've been throwing in. Um, so I imagine that there's folks um, you know, who are joining this course who are familiar with the other pieces of the uh, weights and biases um, ecosystem um, and you know, one thing to note about registry is that it actually introduces um, new new personas into the puzzle. As I mentioned, it's this handoff point between ML practitioners, so the folks regularly using experiment tracking, creating their runs, logging models, um, and the ops team that's deploying the model. Um, and so, some of the new personas, you know, there's that example of ML the ML ops team. They're responsible for for this handoff, and they need to be able to answer. What is what is the best model, and you know, am I and I am I ready to be able to deploy it? Um, then there's the compliance, legal, security stakeholders that I mentioned in, in the customer example. There, um, to them, lineage is really important. Uh, they want this assurance that the, the entire history of the model and the ingredients and components, whether that's metadata, which libraries were used, what pre-processing happened, um, can all be traced. And then lastly, um, you know, the folks, the ML, um, ex an exec, a lead who wants this view of all of the models a team is working on. You know, experimentation is super messy and um, that piece is more of an implementation detail. Uh, the, what people really need to see is, um, you know, what are the, the, published, the published versions? Um, and there's a few folks that I also put in here, including, um, you know, product manager. Um, so this is, um, you know, the, the, the space that, that I'm in. And as PMs, we're currently, or we're constantly looking for, um, hey, where is the documentation for, you know, what the models the team is working on? What is up-to-date performance? Uh, what are the expected outputs? So all of this kind of documentation and model card work also needs to be there for, for this persona. And, you know, before I'll hand it back to Hamill to, to demo, you know, the product and these APIs live, um, I, I first wanted to mentally prepare you uh, as to how easy this really is to do. Um, and that I'm talking about all these kind of like features and important aspects of enterprise model management. You might be thinking, this kind of sounds like a mess to set this all up. Um, and kind of my, my commitment to you is that uh, you can actually do this all, log and link your model in uh, one one line of code. Um, three, if you include, you know, installing weights and biases and, and starting your experiment. And with that being said, um, I'm gonna hand it back to, to Hamelin and uh, super excited to walk through the product itself, some of the APIs um, and transition into to the second part of the course where we'll talk about automating workflows um, for uh, kind of streamlined model, model management and connecting this model management piece to your CI CD pipelines.